welcome to the Narwhals Ontario Election Forum. I'm Denise Balkazoon, the Ontario Bureau Chief, and I'd like to thank you all for coming here today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to say that the Narwhal is committed to upholding the principles of truth and reconciliation in our journalism. I'm grateful to work from Toronto, which is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga, and the Anishinaabeg, as well as Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaties. We would really love to hear where you are all joining us from. So there's a chat box at the bottom if you'd like to let us know um, where you're coming from and which Indigenous nations call that territory home. Um, there should also be a poll popping up on your screen about now, and you can choose which um, of the environmental issues are most important to you in the Ontario election. Or again, if you have a totally different answer, you can put that in the chat. Um, so a little bit about the Narwhal, if you aren't familiar with us, we are a four-year-old digital publication based in British Columbia that focuses on in-depth and investigative journalism about the natural world. And the Ontario Bureau just started last September, and we launched it in part because so many of our readers were already here. I would like to thank the philanthropic foundations who provided the runway funding for us to start the Ontario Bureau. They are the McConnell Foundation, the Metcalf Foundation, and the Echo Foundation. The Narwhal is a pioneer of nonprofit journalism in Canada, um, and we are supported by more than 4,300 monthly members. Um, last March, or sorry, March 2021, we became Canada's first English language registered journalism organization, which means that all of our donors and members receive donation tax receipts. So I'd like to thank anyone in the audience who's already a member of the Narwhal. We really appreciate it, and we really are grateful to have your funding for our journalism. Um, so we have won a bunch of awards and it's currently journalism awards season right now. So we are nominated for a bunch more this year. Our work from 2021 is being considered for national magazine awards, digital publishing awards, and awards from the Canadian Association of Journalists and the Canadian Journalism Foundation. So for those of you who are members, if you become one now, we will send you a print issue full of last year's beautiful in-depth stories. So before we get the panel started, there are some housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded and it will be available for viewing online after the event. Look out for an email tomorrow with a link to the video and the chat transcription. The chat will only be um, accessible to people who were attending the event today. We are providing closed captioning. So to turn it on, you can go to the control panel at the bottom of your screen and select the arrow next to closed captioning. And then you choose show subtitles and that will turn it on. You can also select caption settings to control the size of the captions and you can move the caption box around your screen. Um, we are very grateful to the candidates who are joining us today for making time in the middle of a busy campaign to talk about Ontario's most pressing environmental issues before the June 2nd election. So the two Ontario reporters will be moderating the discussion today. So let me introduce you to Emma McIntosh and Fatima Sayed. Um, are you all on the screen? Okay. Hi. So, Hi. <laughs> I think you two... Um, you guys have a copy of the print issue already, right? I don't have mine yet. So show everyone that's what they get. Um, if they become normal members, it's super pretty. Um, so I'm sure everybody wants one. <laughs> um, so before we introduce the panelists, I thought I would ask you both, um, starting with Fatima, what is your favorite election story that you've done so far? So it's not really an election story, but it's becoming an election issue. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, we published this uh, exclusive, a tiny exclusive about how the Ontario power generation, which is Ontario's larger, largest power uh, provider, um, is has been selling clean energy credits very quietly um, outside of Ontario. And this is a big deal because um, it, it means that there is they're sort of selling off clean electricity that belongs to Ontarians without sort of any public knowledge or, or consultation. Um, there's a lot going on in that story. I recommend everyone read it. And it's become an election issue because uh, all the parties are now talking about boosting clean electricity supply in the province. Um, so I'm hoping to dig in more. Um, it is a really great story. And I believe that that link should be going into the chat too for anyone who hasn't read it yet. Um, so Emma, what is your favorite election story that you've done so far? Like Fatima, mine is 
uh, an election story that wasn't really an election story, but is because it's becoming such a, a big issue on the campaign trail. And that was a little investigation I did into uh, the Ring of Fire and the Ford government's quest to build a road there and secure the funding for that road. Uh, it was based on literally 20 FOI requests that I filed. Um, and usually it's like a big victory to get one back. Um, so that one was definitely a bit of an obsession for me. And it, it's um, it's been great to see it get out in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we have an election newsletter, which you can sign up for. And as we said in our election newsletter this week, um, all the freedom of information requests that Emma filed for that story cost us $796. So um, it's a really great story. She did so much digging. And again, for everyone who's a member and helped us fund it, thank you very much. And anyone who's thinking about a member, that's the kind of thing that your money will go to. Um, so we always want to know what stories are important to you. So there should be another poll popping up right now um, where you can tell us what you think we should be covering next. And yeah, now I am going to get out of here so that Fatima and Emma can introduce our panelists and have a really great discussion. Thanks again, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Denise. Um, so we have three candidates with us today. We've got Lucille Collard, who is the incumbent Liberal MPP for Ottawa Vanier, Diane Sachs, the Green Party candidate for University of Rosedale in Toronto, and Sandy Shaw, the incumbent NDP MPP for Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas. Um, the way this conversation is going to work is Emma and I have four questions for the candidates, um, and we're going to rotate who gets to answer first for each one. Each panelist is going to be allowed two 30 second rebuttals at any point during the conversation. Once they're gone, they're gone. The panelist being rebutted gets an additional 30 seconds to respond. We are gonna do our best to try and fact check and keep these candidates on their toes. So check the chat box for, for any of our fact checks. If there's anything major, um, Emma and I might, might bring it up in conversation. Um, so with that, we're going to start with, um, you know, letting the candidates uh, speak for themselves and introduce themselves in their platforms for a minute. Um, and Lucille, why don't you go first? Well, thank you very much, Fatima. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important discussion on environment. It's something that we hear every day all the time now. And uh, my name is Lucille Collard, and I'm uh, the Ottawa Vanier MPP. And when I was elected two years ago, I was also appointed as the environmental critic. I'm an, I am joining you from Ottawa Vanier on the traditional land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. And I'm passionate about environment because I live in a multi-generational home with my mother, my four kids, my husband, my dog, and my cat. And of course, my kids remind me every day how important it is to protect our planet because as they like to say, there's no planet B, mom, so do something. So uh, I, I want to say that I'm very proud that, uh, you know, the Ontario Liberal Party is proposing some very bold ideas about protecting the environment, addressing climate change. And I was personally part of those consultations. And these ideas come from all Ontarians. So uh, as a critic, I met with a number, uh, a great number of experts and stakeholders. And these ideas are also reflected in our platform. So really looking forward to the uh, discussion together on how we move forward to make sure that we come up with the best solutions for our future. Thank you, Lucille. Diane? Okay, hi. Um, not all readers know that the climate emergency is here, that it changes everything, and that we still have this small window to save the future. I chose the Green Party because based on my 46 years of fighting for the public interest and my work as the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, the Green Party is the only one serious about climate. The Liberal platform with all due respect to the work that Lucille did is way too timid. And the NDP platform cannot work. It depends on extracting $30 billion from Ontario industries. And if we tried to do that, it would put them out of business and their workers out of work. The NDP and Liberals only say no to bad ideas like sprawl and 413 when Greens go first. And when the NDP and Liberals vote, they vote to cancel road tolls, to keep Line 5 running, and to give $1 billion a year to cars. Climate only gets serious attention when Greens are at the table. So if you care about climate, you need more Greens at Queen's Park. Thank you so much, Diane. Sandy. 
Thank you so much for having me here. I'm joining you from Hamilton, uh, West Ancaster, Dundas, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and is covered with the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement as well. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this uh, evening. We need more opportunities to discuss the climate emergency and to discuss our environment. So I thank you very much for the work you do and for hosting this as well. Um, as has been said by everyone, and as we all know, the realities of climate change are here now. Uh, we see you know, flooding, we see tornadoes, forest fires, threats to our clean water. And everyone, almost everyone, uh, perhaps except for the current government, is really concerned about this. And I share with Lucille children and grandchildren who are very worried about our future. And they suffer, you know, it even has a term that is called eco-anxiety. They're very, very worried about their future. And that, you know, what world is this? What kind of government do we have when this? Then we're not taking action to address this for the future? You know, we did see, I would say, 15 years of squandered opportunity when we moved too slowly to get ahead of this crisis. And now we know uh, we have a, for a government with Doug Ford that has done nothing but um, assault the environment, uh, assault our environmental protections, uh, has dragged us backwards probably decades, 10 decades in our fight to uh, get to, to address the, this existential threat that's here now. And so that's why I'm, I am happy to be here tonight to listen to everyone's great ideas, to share uh, the details from our uh, Green New Democratic deal. And the thing that about that that is so important to me and that I'd like to talk about is the fact that it's, it's, uh, it's called the Green New Democratic deal, but it's also climate jobs and justice because it's rooted in the idea of a just transition. It's about equity. It's about uh, reconciliation and it centers in, in this plan, the idea that we can address the climate change, but make sure that we're providing opportunities for everyone and that no one is left behind in a just future uh, that we all hope for ourselves and for our kids and our grandkids. So thank you once again for having me here tonight. Thank you, Sandy. I should mention, uh, and I should have said this at the top, we did invite uh, current Environment Minister David Puccini multiple times uh, to join our event. Uh, he unfortunately declined, as did his parliamentary sec secretary, Andrea Kenjin. So um, we're going to talk about the government record, but I, I wanted to put that out there. Um, so I'm going to ask questions now. I'm going to start with the first question. Um, for the audience, if you see me holding a 10 second sign, that's just to remind speakers that they have 10 seconds left to, so that we can keep the conversation moving and, and get to all of your questions. Um, but to start, um, we wanted to talk about uh, partisanship because the environment wasn't always a partisan issue in Canada. Historically, big name conservatives like David Crombie and Brian Mulroney put their name on important policy addressing conservation and pollution. Yet today, one of the strongest indicators as to whether someone believes climate action is urgent is where they fall on the political spectrum. How would you and your party further climate action without making political polarization even worse? Um, and I'd ask Lucille to start us off. Yeah, thank you for this. And actually, I have a nat natural inclination uh, of working with other parties, especially on issues that we can all agree on. And climate change and environment is certainly one that I've seen several party rally around at, you know, when I was at Queen's Park. I know definitely I've had great conversation with Michael Schreiner and with Sandy and other members of the NDP. And we agree and we vote against the conservative on uh, environmental policies that are destructive. So we do have a plan as the Ontario Liberal to really implement an all party cabinet committee on climate change. That way we can work together, bring our best ideas and really promote great policy that can make a difference for all Ontarians. And I would certainly hope that the conservatives would get on board and help us work on this committee and really work on great policy that will benefit all Ontarians. Thank you, Lucille. Um, Sandy. Hi there. So I, I don't think you can see it, but I've got my Queen's Park uh, watch here, and it has the motto uh, from Queen's Park, which is uh, Audi Alterum Partem, which means hear the other side or listen to the other side. And that's 
how our parliamentary democracy is meant to function. And as Lucille said, I have seen, uh, you know, sit on the same side as Lucille. We listen to good ideas. I, I share a, a lot of good ideas with, with Mike Schreiner. But what we need is a, is a, is a government, a, a, a government that's in power that respects that democracy. What we've seen here is a, a government that has changed all of the standing orders so that they can pass bills in two or three days, that they don't take bills to committee, and that's a really important thing when we take bills to committee, because governments are not going to fix the climate change. Governments are not going to come up with the solutions. They need to have opportunities where there are scientist led decisions, where there's evidence based decisions are being made and that they have to uh, listen to the people of the community, the, uh, the, the people that are on the front lines, the people that are doing this work. They have to uh, give them an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, on legislation, to make legislation better, and to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction when it comes to what is absolutely not a partisan issue, and that is the threat of climate change. Thank you, Sandy. Diane. Well, as you uh, probably can tell, everybody here is a, a woman, and we know that all the way around the world, um, women care more about climate. Uh, women are more likely to be good, constructive climate leaders. Places that are led by women do more about climate. Um, and I, that is exactly what I think would happen. There's no question that rec we can have a lot of shared common ground. Um, so much of the solutions are, are well established now. I mean, Ontario in particular, we really do have the potential to be winners in the new climate economy. We've got the right people. We've got the knowledge. We've got the financial expertise. We've got the industries. We've got the, um, we've got the potential, at least for natural resources, if we can work with the First Nations. What we're completely lacking is political will. And that's why elections are so important. Um, but in terms of our party, we can and do work with everyone. Um, just as when I was commissioner, we provide thought leadership without being a mortal threat to anybody. And that's why, for example, the Black Lives Matter folks came to Mike Schreiner to lead the Emancipation Week bill that ended up being co-sponsored by all four parties, never happened before. When we're strong, the old parties adopt our ideas and like, you know, that's, that's a great way. Let's share ideas. Let's um, move forward because Lord knows we're out of time and we're going to need all the good ideas we can get. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, at this point, do any of you would like to use the rebuttal? No, okay. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. So if, if audience has any questions, feel free to dump them in the Q&A or in the chat and we'll get to them after this. Um, my second question, um, all of the parties say turning Ontario into a manufacturing hub for electric vehicles is an important step towards achieving our climate goals while also ensuring a strong economy. But accessing the minerals that could make electric vehicle batteries has proven tricky for successive governments. The deposits in Ontario's far north are hard to reach, and many of the First Nations there feel inadequately consulted. What's your plan for helping the auto industry pivot towards cleaner vehicles and green jobs? And I'll let Diane start this time. Okay, well, that, I, we could have a really long answer on that. Uh, we've got a very detailed electric vehicle supply chain strategy as part of our, our roadmap to net zero and the subsequent um, briefing notes. But the, the short answer is, of course, we need to have access to metals. Um, and it's not going to be possible to get them the forward way, which is just ignoring the fact that the Indigenous people are there. Um, so we pledged a billion dollars to support Indigenous climate leadership, and in particular, to support Indigenous protected and conserved areas and to give Indigenous people the right to say, go, no, go, um, and to have those determinations go in priority to mining and logging. We've also pledged to adopt uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People into law and to add to that improvements in water protection and better enforcement of the polluted pay principle so we can actually make mining less of a terrible neighbor. And at the same time, we have to minimize the need for mining by fostering zero waste in a circular economy. So there is an absolute potential for us to be a world leader on access to not blood metals and minerals, but clean metals and minerals, but that will only work 
if we have indigenous led access to those minerals and metals. I've had detailed conversations with the indigenous communities and indigenous leaders, and they do want to be part of the clean economy, but they want their, their rights and their existence um, recognized first, and we're gonna to need to do both at the same time. Um, thank you, Diane. Um, thank you. Um, next up, Lucille. Yeah, thank you, Fatima. Uh, of course, you know, uh, manufacturing electric vehicle is an important component if we want to encourage people to use electric vehicles. I think that if we're going to access the mineral in the north, one of the first thing that we need to do is really be respectful of Indigenous nation and consult extensively on how we're going to do that and ensure that they have their share in their prosperity. I think we need to facilitate the connections with the First Nations and to the provincial power grid, and they need their, their share on these agreements. We need to respect them. And um, the other thing that we need to do is really make sure that uh, uh, we give the proper incentives for people also to use the electric vehicle. So we do have a plan to do that. We want to bring back the rebate so that people are encouraged to invest in electric vehicles and uh, reduce our carbon uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission. That's a very important part. And I think that the investment is worthwhile, but again, it needs to be done respectfully. Thank you, Lucille. And uh, Sandy. So absolutely, we cannot talk about uh, Ring of Fire development uh, without first, <laughs> shockingly, we have to talk about the fact that they, there are most of, of so many Indigenous communities do not have access to clean drinking water. I mean, how can we even begin to have this discussion with, without addressing that? How can we begin to have a discussion about development in, the, in the, this area in the far north without talking about the fact that Indigenous uh, communities don't have basic infrastructure, they don't have adequate housing. How can we talk about this with looking at the history of Ontario that has, Ontario is a signatory to Treaty 9, they're a signatory and they have never respected that. Successive governments of Ontario have played jurisdictional ping pong saying it's a federal responsibility, it's a provincial responsibility. Well, nothing has taken place. None of these promises that we have made to indigenous communities have ever happened in Ontario. So I would like to also share that I have sat beside Sal Mamakwa, who's the MPP from Kawitnong. He's the first indigenous MPP in the province. And I have learned through him to hear, well, people talk about uh, getting on a bulldozer, and Doug Ford talks about getting on a bulldozer to build a road to the Ring of Fire. He just says, you know what? We would just like clean drinking water. So I know this is a conversation about electric vehicles, but boy, we need to start with the, with the very fundamental human rights that we are not respecting in this province when it comes to Indigenous people. Thank you, Sandy. At this point, is there anyone who wants to use a rebuttal? No? Okay, I will mention that, uh, and, and, and Lucille, feel free to respond to this, but um, there are some First Nations in the Ring of Fire that have called the previous Liberal government's approach divisive. Um, and I will also note that the Liberal platform only mentions electric vehicles once, uh, and they do so in a sentence that says they're gonna, they promise to make electric vehicles more affordable. Yes, so so thank you for allowing me to respond to this. In fact, uh, you know, bringing the rebate on electric vehicle is only one of the way we really want to change the way we move uh, to bring it uh, in a more sustainable way. So we also have other measure like to bring transit, allow people to uh, use the bus or the the, um, the go train for one dollar a ride to encourage people to use public transit. Uh, we also want to give a rebate on e-bicycle and make sure that we expand our bike lanes in our municipalities to be safe and uh, usable, uh, user-friendly and uh, really practical for people to use. So, you know, there is really more than just the, uh, the incentive on, on e-vehicles. And, uh, you know, I'll have more to say uh, later in the, uh, in the debate. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Emma for more questions. Thanks Fatima and thanks candidates. Um, this one is about housing and the push and pull between development and the environment. So as we know, Ontario is in a housing affordability crisis and many believe that quickly ramping up our supply is necessary to address that. 
Now, a number of cities and towns need to decide whether they want to allow development on farmland and green space near the green belt. Some of them are, others are resisting what they say is pressure from the Ford government. But what I wanna know is what is your plan for increasing access to housing while preserving farmland and green space? First, we're gonna to go to Sandy. I'm pretty proud to be from Hamilton, which I would say created the made in uh, Ontario pushback to stop sprawl. Um, I mean, I stood so shoulder to shoulder with the, these folks here in Hamilton and they're remarkable. So they understood that these are two, not two mutually exclusive ideas, that we can protect farmland, we, don't, we can hold firm the urban boundaries and still create housing that people can afford. And so, you know, that's reflected in, in our platform. We, we need to understand that just continuing to, to sprawl, to, big, to, to build highways, to big homes that people can't afford is not going to solve the, uh, the housing affordability crisis. And in fact, it's only going to make the, 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 our climate problems worse. We know, it's been said before by maybe perhaps someone here that, you know, urban sprawl is Ontario's uh, tar sands, and it's absolutely true. And so I think the whole point of, 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 of what we're seeing when it comes to climate discussions um, in Ontario is this idea that it's either or, and that is not the case. We can preserve farmland, we can protect our green spaces and we can create affordable, affordable housing uh, with exclusion with, and get, getting rid of um, the kinds of uh, land planning policies, getting rid of the kinds of, uh, um, you know, Ontario Land Tribunal uh, rulings that, that make, make it very difficult for municipalities to have control over how they grow their housing and how they plan for their futures. And so we, you know, we should have a government that can do two things at one time. And that's what we would be plan to do, protect farmland, protect our green, uh, our green spaces, and make sure there's an adequate supply of affordable housing, housing rentals for people in Ontario. Thank you for that. Next, we have Diane. Yes, hi. Um, listen, I, I think it's only fair to say that both councillors in both Hamilton and Halton region have credited me with starting their resistance to that sprawl, starting with my report in 2019 to the Ontario, Legis Ontario legislature about the enormous damage that sprawl does. And yes, sprawl is RL sense. Um, and that also some talks that I gave there subsequently and other assistance I gave them in organizing their resistance. And they're absolutely right to do it. But to go back to the phrasing of your question, your question assumes that there's a conflict between climate action that we need to keep a livable future and a life that we can afford. And there isn't such a conflict. What we can't afford anymore are dumb things like sprawl and highways. And both of the NDP and the Liberals support building more highways. Our housing policy shows how to connect the dots as the Toronto Star said, it's a masterclass in that with how to build housing, not highways. The life we can afford gets big oil out of our wallets and people out of exhausting commutes. And we have managed to achieve the worst congestion in North America here in the GTA because of the sprawl we've built already. And we know that by putting people first over profits, we can build 1.5 million new homes in existing urban areas where we already have services and already have transit and already have jobs. And not having to own a car is the same as a big raise. According to the research I was looking at today, owning a car now in Canada costs about the same as renting a two bedroom apartment. So biggest thing we can do to help people with affordability is to help them live in existing urban areas where they don't have to own a car. And Thank we've got you, so many opportunities. Thank you. Next we'll go to Lucille. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the housing crisis is real. It needs to be addressed just at the same level as we need to address the climate change, but it doesn't have to be incompatible. We do have a plan to build more supply of houses in the order of 1.5 billion more houses over the next 10 years with 138,000 houses that would be affordable housing and 22,000 of these, which would be reserved for indigenous families that desperately need them. But it needs to be uh, said that, you know, we can't bail over the Green Belt. Uh, the Green Belt was a creation of the Liberal Party, if you'll remember, and we need to continue to protect that and even expand it. And we need to stop urban sprawl and make sure that we promote smart densification. That's the only way that we're going to address the crisis of housing and at the same time, uh, you know, protecting the environment. We need to work with other levels of government to achieve that. 
So, uh, you know, that's what I'm hoping to uh, be able to do. And uh, just on the highway part, uh, liberals don't support highway. We've already said that Highway 413 is a big mistake, that that's the first thing we'll cancel when we get elected. And the highway are only supported to the extent that the funds have already been engaged, that there's been appropriate uh, environmental assessment done on that, and that they are very necessary to allow people to move uh, uh, efficiently in the province. Thank you for that. Um, would anyone like to use a rebuttal this round? Reminder that if you don't use them, you'll lose them. No? Okay. Well, our final question from the, the ones from me and Fatima is coming up. Um, so the bulk of Ontario's emissions come from industry and from transportation, but time and time again, Ontarians have seen governments pass policies that prioritize business interests in these sectors instead of climate policy. Um, how will you be helping bring emissions down in the face of pressure from industry and from corporations? Uh, first, we'll go to Diane. Well, the, the short answer is having climate activists at the table is about the only way to do it. Uh, again, as I've said before, our experience has been, in, and Mike's experience has been for the last four years that when greens are there, the issues get raised and when greens aren't there, they, aren't, they, they don't. The, there certainly is a lot of inertia from existing businesses that are profiting from ex existing pattern of use. And so the only way we're gonna get different results is if we have different people at the table. And for example, we know that making driving uh, more expensive is essential if we're going to be able to reduce our emissions. And if the old parties need to make driving cheap, we're not gonna get there. Okay, thank you. Next, Lucille. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, I think the industry has a very important part in reducing greenhouse gas emission. We do have an ambitious objective of reducing uh, emissions by half by 2020 and going net zero by 2050. But we fully realize that industry needs to be part of that solution. So we need to strengthen the, the measures that we have to make polluters space. And we need the uh, the industry to be part of that, and they need to pay for the pollution for the for the pollution, and the amount that they emit to encourage them to shift their way of doing business so that they can use more environmentally friendly uh, practices. So you know it's a uh, it's a plan to the incentivize businesses to be part of the solution because uh, polluters, uh, you know, we know industry, especially the cement and the uh, um, the other uh, sectors are big emitters. And so they need to be part of the solutions. And what government can do is raise the standards to make sure that they do their part. Okay. And last but not least, Sandy, go ahead. Well, I think that you know, people listening to this say that we individuals at home think like, we're playing our part. They're doing what they can to reduce their emissions. They and they expect the same um, of industry and they expect the same of government to be the to be the oversight to to either incent or to enforce uh, the, the, these kinds of standards when, when it comes to industrial emissions. But I think one of the pieces in this conversation, it's a big conversation, is understanding energy use. And, and the, the fact that, that we, do not, we don't have a clear uh, mix of energy uses that will get us right now uh, to a, a net zero uh, um, Ontario. I mean, I think everyone here agrees that we need to move to a net zero Ontario, but we don't have a clear, uh, we don't have a clear roadmap to do that, whether it's the way, we, uh, uh, the, way, way the way we manufacture, the way we move our transit and our transportation, or whether it's the way we build. So I think this is a, this is a very long conversation, but fundamental to this is that people expect to have a government that will have a plan to do this and that they will hold, as Lucille said, polluters accountable, that there will be not only incentives, but there will be true penalties and that we can see clearly in Ontario um, um, hope and progress that is being led by our government. Okay, now would anyone like to use a rebuttal? Okay, 
Okay, well, in that case, I wanted to jump in then. Um, there was some talk earlier about the Liberal and NDP stances on highways, and I wanted to, to give everyone a little bit of time to clarify that. Sandy, uh, do you want to go first and explain the NDP stance on highways? Uh, absolutely. I mean, when it comes to uh, Highway 413, we are completely opposed to that. I mean, it just goes against everything that we stand for and against really everything that Ontarians stand for. I mean, we want to grow the green belt in Ontario. We don't want to build a highway through it. Um, you know, we want to protect our water and our clean water and our wetlands. We don't want to pave over the wetlands. So, so building highways is such a backwards um, uh, approach to uh, to growth. Most, almost everyone in Ontario is opposed to it. It's not a popular idea. The only person, the only people that will benefit that from that, it's well known. People did investigative reporting on this, that the people that most clearly benefit this are from the land speculators, the developers that hold, that own land along the route of the 413. So we are completely opposed to 413 and the Bradford bypass as well. Thanks, Sandy. Lucille, how about you? Yeah, sure. I can supplement the previous answer that I provided. So we are totally against IOA 413 because we know it's not going to bring any benefit to population except maybe for some rich developers. So we already pledged to cancel that IOA 413 and to use instead the $12 billion that we would save to invest in our schools, to repair schools, to build, to build new schools that are much needed, to improve GO train and not induce demand for cars. So, you know, I, as I said earlier, uh, you know, we're not against highways. Some highways have already been committed, have gone through extensive uh, environmental assessment are necessary for efficient, uh, you know, travel in, in the province, and, and we would continue to support that. But the Highway 413 is a no-brainer. We just need to get rid of that plan as soon as we get in power. Okay, and, and can you just clarify the government's stance on the Bradford Bypass as well, Lucille? Yeah, and, and I've said it before, so I think as, as for the bypass, uh, the environmental assessment that was conducted on that is so old that we really need to redo our homework and really have a, a clean and a clear determination as to whether uh, this is a good project to support. So we would want to, we would put it on pause and really uh, make another evaluation about the value. Of, of this particular project and the impact it would have on the environment because things have changed, uh, you know, uh, the, the environment has changed. Uh, there are other factors that we need to take into consideration. So we would like to have another hard look at this. Okay, thanks Lucille. And next we can go to you, Diane. Uh, maybe you wanna clarify your comments from earlier um, on why you said the other parties support highways and well, their platforms both say they'll build highways. I mean, I just managed to put, put in the chat the quote from the NDP platform. Um, I have got the, the liberal one here, but I don't have it sort of easy to cut and paste. But they've got uh, both parties say, oh, yeah, we're going to keep building things. So and the, uh, the anyway, we shouldn't need another assessment for the Bradford bypass. It's just a terrible idea um, in, in a precious and irreplaceable area. But bottom line is we say no more highways in the very same way that we've had cl uh, climate experts all around the world say, don't build any more fossil fuel lock-in. We shouldn't build any more fossil fuel infrastructure. We shouldn't build any more highways. And both of the other parties keep saying they're going to build more highways. So not as bad as the conservatives who are also going to build uh, a 413 and the Bradford bypass, but still pretty bad. Okay. I saw Lucille's hand go up. Um, and then we can come to you, Sandy. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm loving that we're using the rebuttals now. Oh, they're going to get used up now. <laughs> yeah. 30 seconds. So, so, Lucille. Yeah, thank you. So, I, I would like some clarification. I thought the Greens also support highways to the north. If we need to get access to these precious metal to, be, uh, to build batteries, so how are we going to get there if we don't have an highway? Uh, since the current assessments also of the um, the Bradford bypass is dated, uh, you know, from 1997. Uh, how how do we feel that we should go about that? And that may be a question for Sandy. Uh, you know, I know you are opposed to the the Bradford, but if the assessment, a new assessment, would come positive, uh, would that change your mind? So I guess to rebuttal for uh, both Diane and Sandy. Okay, we'll go to Sandy first. Sandy, go ahead. Does that mean Lucille's used up both hers because she rebutted me and Diane? Is that how that works? 
So, we, we didn't account for the situation. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, Lucy, I'll just say that I did write to the federal ministry, a minister of environment, to request a new, um, a new environmental assessment for the Bradford Bypass. And he declined my request, saying that none of nothing has changed since the last time that that was done. So, I mean, I was shocked by that answer. So if the, if this minister is going to uh, create another environmental assessment, I'd be happy to see the results of that. But so far, they've refused to do that. Um, and when it comes to building highways, I mean, I think we this is why we need to focus on the idea of a just transition, because one size does not fit all. And when you look at agri rural and far north communities, I mean, they have highways that are not safe for them to drive on. They uh, don't have access uh, to communities. I mean, there's certain communities where you, you don't even have a highway, you have to fly in. There are not even roads. So I think we can't, you know, we need to make sure that we don't have such a, a, a blanket statement that doesn't understand the lived realities of all people in, on, all, of, of all, in all of Ontario. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Diane, final word on this before we go to reader questions, 30 seconds. Well, as I said in, in the chat, in our platform, we clearly made an exception for the North. Uh, and if there are repairs in need for safety, that's different. We don't need to build new highways to do safety repairs. Thank you. Okay, well, now we're gonna go to the reader question segment. Um, some of you keeners sent questions in advance. So we've already been through a few and we have a couple picked out. And while Fatima asked them, I'm gonna go through and pick some more. So thank you to everyone who sent those. Um, and I'll hand it over to you, Fatima. Um, I will note that we are going to do one more bonus rebuttal for the reader question round, um, but when it's gone, it's gone. So best of luck. <laughs> um, I love the back and forth. I love the questions that are coming in. I've actually picked some. Uh, I actually want to start one uh, that I saw in the Zoom audience. Um, it's someone, Mark sent in a question asking, how will your parties help people in rural areas reduce their dependence on oil, natural gas, and propane? I figured that's a nice transition from, from all this talk about highways. Um, Sandy, why don't you go first? So Fatima, you just cut out there for a second. I, I apologize, I didn't hear. No, that's okay. Yeah, I can be. repeat it. So yeah, Mark I'm so asked, sorry. My, I just feel like my audio, my thing went crackly there for a second, sorry. Mark asked, how will your parties help people in rural areas reduce their dependence on oil, natural gas, and propane? Well, I, I think that's the, I think that's why we need a plan that is like the Green New Democratic deal that looks at a just transition. We need to, we need to uh, understand what, what, uh, what clean technologies exist, what we can do to make the, clean tech, the transition to clean technologies affordable and accessible for everyone, whether they're in agriculture, rural, remote, remote. I know that agricultural communities rely so heavily right now on generators, for example, in the fields, and, that's, and that they want to get off that dependency. So we need to come up with a way that we can have an, a, an energy mix, an energy grid, that allows uh, uh, people in agricultural communities, rural, far north, to, um, to continue to be able to do what they need to do, but also can play a role in uh, in, in uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. It's something that we can do, but we can only do it if we take the time to understand everybody's uh, requirements and everybody's unique circumstances when it comes to um, how they use energy and what they need to use it for to, to, uh, to, to participate in our economy and just to live their lives. Thank you, Sandy. Diane, how would your party help uh, rural communities get off uh, fossil fuels? Well, there are so many examples. So for example, thinking about transportation, there's been a tremendous pilot project in the Northern Bruce Peninsula of putting in EV chargers at tourist destinations. So that cost, uh, I think about a million and a half dollars. It was funded through the Brigham Foundation and provided a bulk buy of electric chargers for I think 60, 50 or 60 of the local um, tourist destinations. And that has allowed the entire area now to have access to chargers and the people who live there. Tremendous uh, for tourist development and really good for getting costs down for those people. In terms of buildings, we know that there's um, a significant number. When I did my report, about 16% of Ontarians were still heating their houses um, with 
uh, baseboard heaters in a lot of those buildings were really old and leaky. Uh, and also, of course, people using oil and propane in leaky houses. And so making buildings much more efficient so they use less energy, tremendously important for getting costs down and in increasing the quality of life. We've got money in there for that. Uh, and then, of course, there's the opportunities in rural areas to use biomass for power and other things. Thank you. Thank yes. You guys thanks, in Diane. Yeah, lots of stuff <laughs> farmers can do. Lucille. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, the north and the rural areas in Ontario are included and in part of our plan. So all the measures that would apply in our municipality to give incentives to uh, people to buy electric vehicles, whether it's an e-bike or, or, or a car, would apply also in the northern regions. We would also make community transportation grants permanent for smaller and rural communities to pay for transit. This is one way of supporting them with, you know, financial need. We need to empower the leaders in Northern Ontario to coordinate regional transit planning. So they need to be part of the solutions and they are included, whether it's grants to retrofit homes to be more energy efficient or the other ones to uh, tackle a move towards a green energy, the North and rural communities are included in our plan. Thank you, Lucille. Um uh, this brings me nicely to my next question, because uh, all of you brought up, you know, uh, access to grid and electricity in your answers. And we got a lot of questions from the audience, actually, about electricity and emissions. Um, they noted, you know, we, we, we saw the report in the Toronto Star and also in my reporting about OPG that Ontario's emissions from electricity generation are set to skyrocket by 400% as nuclear plants go offline for refurbishment and are replaced by natural gas. How would your party tackle emissions from the electricity grid? I will also note that uh, during the debate yesterday, yesterday or Monday, whenever it was this week, <laughs> um, Doug Ford said he wouldn't be happy until we got 100% clean grid. Uh, and I'm wondering if your party has a plan for that. Uh, let's start with Sandy. I'm sorry, I'm shocked by the Premier's comment. How's that? That's so that would be wonderful if we had a Premier that actually was moving in the direction to a clean grid, but what we see is a, a Premier that's moving in the exact opposite direction. And so the energy uh, file has, is, is um, you, you know, it, number one, I think what we need to do is get politicians out of making the plans for our energy mix. I mean, we saw the sell off of Hydro One has to be said, which put us so far behind when we had some we have, would have control over how we made energy planning decisions. We need to have uh, planning decisions around uh, electricity that are led by science led, led by experts that are about making sure that these decisions aren't made by politicians. Having said that, you know, everyone here understands that we need to start invest in renewable energy, um, but we need to move in a way that stabilizes the grid. So we, we have a, a province, you know, that was uh, founded, our manufacturing se sector is founded on uh, public power. Uh, clean public power and we can get back to that but we need to take the politics out of it so as we move forward we need to not only have um, uh, the plan for renewable energy but we have to make sure that people um, have confidence in a government that's moving in an, in an achievable and um, uh, ambitious way and that understands the urgency of addressing a, a clean grid but also understands you, that we need it to be in a way that uh, respects everyone and respects the, the energy planners that we have in this province. Thanks. Uh, Lucille. Yeah, I think we really need to move to a clean uh, electricity energy supply. And one of the things that we need to do, in, and it's a commitment that we made, is to ban new gas plants that you know are soaring with emissions. And if we uh, follow the course that we have, we're going to see a 600% increase of emissions. So really important to ban to ban those uh, new uh, new natural gas plants. Uh, and we need to move to a, uh, a new energy a grid in a um, gradual way. We need to include hydroelectricity, we need to include nuclear, we need to include renewables. So there needs to be a mix. So we need a strategy with uh, you know some good uh, timelines and a plan uh, to move gradually so that we don't starve ourselves from energy because uh, let's face it, we're not gonna be needing less energy, we'll be needing more. So uh, it's all about making smart decisions involving the right people to make sure that we move in a gradual way. 
Thank you, Lucille. Um, I will note, Lucille, you said 600%. It's 400% according to the, to the IESO um, increase. <laughs> and, if, <laughs> and if anyone's listening, um, the difference, Hydro One uh, only takes care of the transmission of electricity, doesn't supply electricity. So keep that in mind when you're listening to the answers if it comes up. Uh, Diane, over to you. Well, thanks, Christina. I wanted to make that point because there's nothing but selling Hydro One changes our electricity supply. Um, and contrary to Lucille's point, we absolutely could be using a lot less uh, energy. We waste about two thirds of what we have right now. But let's go back to electricity. Uh, one of the key things that distinguishes our plan from the other parties, and this is part of how I know the other parties aren't really serious, is that we need to replace most of the fossil fuels, the 16 to $25 billion a year of fossil fuels that we use in Ontario, we need to replace that pretty much all with electricity. And that means we need to double our electricity supply by 2040. Um, and we show how to do that using renewables and storage. We have to double renewables in the next four years, triple them again by 2030, and then double the entire system by 2040. And we can do all of that with technology that exists right now. Um, and that way we also make ourselves much more independent from international oil price shocks and we keep more money here and we clean the air we make the uh, and we become winners in the climate economy so we can do all those things. Now one of the other things we have to do is get smarter about how we use electricity, a very disproportionate part of the cost of our electricity system comes from meeting peak demand, and we um, we're being gutless about dealing with that. But we've got so many tools and electric vehicles and bi-directional vehicle chargers can actually be a critically good part of increasing our nighttime load, decreasing our daytime load, especially if we combine that with conservation and proper pricing and solar to help meet our peaks. So we absolutely can do this. We've shown how in our plan. Um, those who are interested, go back to my 2018 report on electricity that I did Thank see. you, Diane. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the note. I'm sorry about that, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go, we'll do two more reader questions and then we'll wrap up for, for anyone in the audience who has like a time constraint, um, just to let you know what's going on. Um, I want to talk about MZOs. This, these are the ministerial zoning orders that the Ford government has, has used uh, quite a lot in their tenure and that Emma has reported on a, a lot. I'm sure you guys have seen the links in the chat. Um, can you tell me what your party stance are on MZOs? How would they be used by your party? And how would you improve procedural transparency? Because one thing we've seen is that these MZOs have not been used in a way that the public knows what's going on or, or the reasoning hasn't been shared. Um, so let's start with with Lucille. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, yeah, the use, or I would say the abuse of MZOs that we've seen by this Conservatives government has been a real concern, especially using the pandemic as an excuse to use uh, MZOs under the cover of uh, building infrastructure or going with projects that are desperately needed. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen that all these projects were not for the benefit of uh, protecting people from the pandemic and that some really bad choices were made. Uh, but the, the most concern that we have is that the use of MZO totally bypass appropriate consultation, environmental assessment. And so, you know, what we need to do uh, is to transition to another sort of regulatory authorization to allow to fast track project when it's needed, but have some benchmark and, and some accountability principle to guide how these decisions are made and to ensure proper consultation. Uh, so, you know, uh, nobody will disagree here, I'm sure tonight, that the MZOs have been abused by the Conservatives, that we need to move away from that. When the Liberals were there, they used the MZOs a handful of time over their old term, while the Conservative uh, used them regularly just as uh, bypassing regulatory power. So very big concern here. Thank you, Lucille. Diane. Uh, yes, thank you. The um, So what we've said is that we would be very, very restrictive use of ministerial zoning orders in the future, but we would also go back and retroactively revoke any that were passed under the Ford government that uh, adversely affected provincially significant wetlands, which really we cannot afford to lose. There, we'd also need to think about um, snow washing, the use of dirty money to in through Ontario 
uh, real estate holdings to launder money in the international economy. This is a real problem that we have here as well. And you folks are investigating the relationships between money and donations and these kinds of orders. And I look forward to you writing more about it. Um, but for sure, they've been terribly abused. Um, public consultation, environmental protections have been bulldozed and they need to stop. Thank you, Diane. Uh, last but not least, Sandy. Well, if we need want to stop the abuse of MZOs, we need a new government. There, there's just absolutely no no question there. And that fact that you know all across the province, I've stood with communities that have been uh, the, you know victimized by this use of MZO, which really has overridden any good planning decisions, has overridden any environmental protections. I mean, it's hard to imagine if there are any environmental protections left in the province, given what this government has done. So we need to get back to the idea of good, listening to planners, good planners, and, and making those kinds of decisions. You know, we have a system, we have basically now uh, chaos when it comes to land planning in, in the province. And we have communities that have had to, you know, take literally march to protect a wetlands and march to protect your environmental protected species. So um, the, this, this use and misuse of MZOs is only one of the kinds of things that this government has done, uh, including the land use uh, planning changes, the, 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 the changes to the Ontario Land Tribunal. All of these are tools in the toolbox that this government has used uh, you know, to to uh, deliver uh, public lands and public benefits to to their their buddies, essentially. And so we had we have uh, the ability Sandy. to stop Sorry. this, and we've got the communities that are prepared to to uh, to uh, stand up as well. Thank you so much. Um, quick yes or no. This is a question from Joan. Will you commit to expanding the green belt? Yes or no. We'll just go around the round the Zoom. Diane. <laughs> yes. Lucille. Absolutely. Sandy. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Um, my last question before before we wrap up. Um, this is from uh, Deborah. Uh, kind of like a throw to our first question, but it does matter so much to people. How do you envision working to meaningfully help Ontario residents see the reality of the climate crisis and be open to the changes required, many of which you are proposing? Um, and we see this coming up time and time again, where after the four years that we've had, how does everyone work together for the climate emergency and, and how do we get residents on board? Um, let's start with Diane. All right. So one of the quotes that I like the best about this is we can focus on the disasters that climate chaos is bringing us, or we can fall in love with the solutions. I've spent a lot of time scaring people about climate, and there's lots and lots to be frightened about. But there's also so much to fall in love with. And that's why I have my podcast, Green Economy Heroes, where I profile green business leaders across the country who are making a living building the green economy. And I think it's that hope that people need to see. We know that there are going to be more and more climate disasters. That people are going to get a kick in the, a kick in the teeth, a kick in the gut. Um, but we need to also have a sense of how to go forward and that it is possible to get there and still have a good life. So that's what our roadmap is for. That's what my podcast is for. We do have the solutions. We can have a better future. And the disasters are coming to help us take advantage of them. Thank you, Diane. Lucille. Yeah, um, thank you for this. And uh, I think that to answer really your questions about how do we bring people on board, how do we make them understand the benefit of moving towards a more uh, green economy, I think it's to really have good communication and, and talk to uh, the heart of people, make them see the benefits for their children and for future generation about uh, you know the impact of protecting our planets, uh, making our planet healthier for everyone and and also basing uh base based our information on science uh, because you know you need to talk to the heart but you need to talk to the logical part of people and i think we just need to promote it more and i think most people are sensible i think people are seeing what's been happening people are seeing the floods the fire the uh, extreme temperature and i think just good communication and keep promoting it and just uh, promoting the uh, bright side of the solution that we're proposing, I think, can go a long way. Thank you, Lucille. And last but not least, Sandy. I, I think that we have to make sure that people have 
renewed confidence that governments that are making decisions are making these decisions for them, for individuals, for everyday Ontarians. And I just want to end, end this answer by talking to the people of Wheatley and about the people of Wheatley. I mean, this is a town that had an abandoned oil and gas well that blew up. Their, their downtown core was flattened. People were, were sent to hospital uh, and the government abandoned them. And so there's an example of a community that um, was left behind when they needed help from their government. And when people see that, when they see, when they see that kind of uh, cynicism, it makes it very difficult for them to believe that governments are making decisions for them and that they will be there uh, to help them as we transition. Because we see in Wheatley, no one was there to help them when they transitioned. And we need to reassure people and restore confidence that governments uh, will center all of these decisions as we transition on everyday Ontarians. Thank you so much to you all. I know we had so many more questions, but I hope I got to, um, you know, uh, most of the themes that you guys were, were getting at. Emma and I still have some, a lot of follow-up questions that we've been taking notes on. It's always hard with these conversations because we really want to know how these parties are going to do this and how, how these candidates are going to do things, but I hope you'll keep asking it as we head to the ballot box. So um, I'm going to hand it over back to Denise. For, for closing this uh, amazing conversation off. Oh, Denise is muted. I am muted. <laughs> I've only been doing Zoom for two years. Um, thanks so much, everyone, Lucille, Sandy, Diane. That was a really great conversation. Um, and I know Emma and Fatima poked you guys to uh, fight a little bit, but you know what? It's true that we will only deal with the climate crisis in Ontario um, through collaboration. And I really appreciated the conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Fatima and Emma, for such excellent moderation. Thank you to everyone in the audience for coming out tonight. Um, and if you would like to become one of the 4,300 people that support the Narwhal, remember that you can sign up and we will send you um, our print magazine, which <laughs> Fatima is showing you here. It's very beautiful. Uh, we really believe that the Narwhal brings something new and vital to the Canadian media landscape, and we need your help to keep funding our journalism. So thank you all so much and have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night and thanks so much.